as we continue to worship. You may be seated, but as we continue in the attitude of prayer. This morning, some of you may be facing some very deep and overwhelming waves that may be crashing into the reality of your life. It seems to be crushing and hitting in a time and maybe a season of life that you never dreamed or expected it to be. Today, at this moment, I would just ask that you would keep your eyes above the waves and look across the waves and look into the face of Christ who is coming upon the troubled waters to you, to hold you, to guide you, to strengthen you, to equip you. Whatever need that you have this morning, I pray that you would take your eyes off of that concern or need and that you would place your eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, who is the source of our healing, our strength, our peace, our joy, our comfort. And that you would today believe that God is greater than the storm that you're in right now. That the waves still know God's name. And when God speaks, the storms must be still. When God appears, the waves must cease. So Father, we come before you and we ask for the needs of your people who are crying out to you. Whatever needs you have today, whatever concern, whatever grief it may be, lay it before Christ. Trust that he is greater than the waves, the storms, the wind, the anxiety, the fear. Lord, as we come, we want to, we face as a church some waves just from the standpoint of people in our life that we love so much that have been such a great impact on this church for decades. Lord, we want to lift up our brother Larry McAlpine and the cancer that is that has attacked his body. In all intents and purposes, the waves seem too great. They seem too high. They seem too insurmountable. But Father, you are greater than the waves of even cancer. So Lord, help our unbelief, help our lack of faith, and help us to come before you and petition you on behalf of Larry today for healing in the powerful name of Jesus. Lord, we know it's not by our might or our power or our request that it will be done. It will be done by your will and your might and your purpose so that your name will be exalted, that your name would be glorified. So we pray that you would heal this precious man. That you would be with Pam, his wife, as she faces this, these waves that are attacking her emotions right now and the fear of seeing her husband have to suffer through this. We pray for that peace that passes understanding that, Lord, that is literal, that it's real. It's not just a metaphor. We pray for a peace to fall upon them today right now as they sit at Forsyth Hospital and that you would surround that room with your presence, the weight of your glory, that you would fill that room, that you would fill each of their temples to overflowing, that they would experience a mercy and a grace like never before, that they would know that people are petitioning on, behalf, on their behalf. Lord, we lift him up Father, we lift up our own concerns to you as well and trust that you are greater still than the waves that we face. We pray for all those that are sick right now, Lord. We want to pray for, uh, for uh, Kelly Slater, just who's going through some very uh, serious dehydration issues, and we just want to pray for her healing, Lord. Lord, we want to pray for uh, your strength and your mercy and your grace with David Spriggs as he goes in for a hip replacement this week, and just pray that you would just... 
uh, use the doctors to, for your glory and for your strength and your might. That you would heal the brokenness in his hip, Lord. Lord, I pray for each of us that no matter what we're going through, that we would know that you still are greater. That we'd understand it's more than words that I say. It's really the truth and the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you will not leave us or forsake us. You will not abandon us. That you come to us in the storms of life and you make yourself known. May we know that peace too today. Father, we pray now as we come to your message, your word, we pray that you would plant it into good soil that it would take root today, that it would bear fruit for your glory and for your kingdom and for your purpose. I pray that I would step aside and that you would step in and that your name would be glorified in this place. We love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning also we've got some uh, a joy to mention as well. Uh, we've got uh, Mary and Mark Lay are back there in the back corner with their newest edition. Uh, they know how to make boys. Uh, this is number five. Number five. I asked them if they were going for a six pack, but they didn't think that was funny. And they're not going to really go for that as well. But uh, we want to just pray and thank, thank God that Owen is, is with us today. Little Owen, right? Little Owen's back there in the, in the back and sleeping tight maybe right now or who knows what it may be. So make sure you congratulate them and encourage them. And just uh, we want to just thank God for uh, the great joy. It's amazing in life that even in the midst of pain, there's also great exceeding joy. So even as we pray and we grieve for uh, the pain that Larry, our brother, is going through, we also celebrate because uh, we can rejoice with those who rejoice and we can mourn with those who mourn. So if we continue in our prayers not to forget all those sides because God is a gracious God even in the midst of uh, difficulties that we go through. But uh, we want to welcome you this morning to the third week of our series called Kaleo uh, where we've been diving into the understanding of the Greek word call, uh, that we are called uh, beyond just what the world thinks of calling. And we've talked about that in the series that we're addressing that was ever since you were old enough to talk, people asked you, what are you going to do when you grow up, right? All of you had that question. If you were playing with a fire truck, they thought you were going to be a policeman. If you were playing with a, a fire engine, they thought you were going to be a, a fireman or, or vice versa. If you had your, your, you know, which is not kosher now, cowboys and Indians, right? When you had your holsters on and your, your guns, you thought you were going to be a cowboy and very few people wanted to be the Indians and, and that kind of thing. But in that day, but we we talk about what we're going to do in life and regardless of where we go, we're going through our teen lives. We kind of ask, kind of like skirt it, don't we? They say, what are you going to do when you grow up? You're like, well, I don't really know. I like this. I like that. It keeps it minimized and stuff like that. But then when you get to college, you feel that overwhelming pressure. Or if you, if you didn't go to college, you feel that overwhelming pressure to pick that job because you think that that job that you pick, you're going to be with for life, right? Because that's what our parents did. Right? That's what our, our dad's disease was. My dad did. I mean, my dad had one similar job for his whole life. And I'm thinking, wow. It's like, I don't know if I would, could do that. I don't have enough patience in me. I get bored too easily. Is anybody that way? It's like, it's like, you know, once you get it fixed and you're done, you're like, okay, what's left? You know, what do we do now? It's like, hmm. You know, my dad did the same thing every day for multiple years. He's still doing the same thing now at 76 years old. I'm going, oh, give me the Maalox. Give me the whatever it may be. I can't imagine doing the same thing over and 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 over again. But so we feel that pressure because if we are going to do something over and over and over and over again, we want to be joyful in it. Don't we want to love what we do? right? And we have this overwhelming pressure that somehow we're called to this specific career. And one thing that we've learned in the first two weeks is that the most important calling we have on life is a spiritual calling. It's unto salvation. That literally throughout scripture, when we talk about calling, it has to do with a spiritual connotation. It doesn't have to do with an earthly work life. But we're going to talk about the work life today, but more importantly, make sure we realize that our calling in life, whether we have a great job or a, a poor job, is to make sure that we're initially called to salvation, that we know that our hope is in Jesus Christ no matter what we do, and that we bear his name, because that's another part of the calling, that we take on the attributes of God, and we bear his name properly. And last week, we looked at the fact that part of that bearing his name is to proclaim the excellencies of knowing that salvation, which is pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, if you're in Christ, you have something good to tell the world, don't you? Don't you? 
Oh boy, you guys are pitiful. That, I would, that would not sell. If you were door to door salesman, Terry, would that work? Right? If you were a salesman, you walk in, it's like, oh, I got the best windows in the world. <laughs> would you buy that? No, you wouldn't buy that. It's okay to be joyful about that Christ changes things. It's not a false hope. It's not a, a little lie that we tell the world. It's like, even if it's difficult, I know that I've been called to salvation. Even if this world fades away and gets destroyed, I know that there's something that awaits me in eternity. Even though I waste away here physically, I have an inward nature that is my soul is being restored day by day by knowing Christ Jesus. And that's something good that we can proclaim regardless of who we are, regardless of our gift mix. We can tell people about the joy that Christ brings. And that's our calling, that's our ultimate calling, but yet we still, don't we, struggle with, what am I going to do when I grow up? Some of you have grown up, and you've been grown up for a long time, and you still ask yourself the question every day, am I doing what I was created to do? Somebody ask you that, ever ask that question? Am I really making a difference? Anybody? Or is it just me? Once again, you guys are more holy than I am, that's okay. But sometimes I ask, am I really doing what I'm supposed to do? Am I really where I'm supposed to be? Is this really all that God has for my life? I mean, because ultimately we look at the world, the world looks at life based on the career because the first thing they usually ask you when they meet you is like, what do you do? Besides they ask your name, they say, well, what do you do for a living? And it's ironic to watch how people respond, you know, because we think that there's these ultimate callings, right? These careers, it's like, oh, you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, or you're a, you know, a congressman, or a, who wouldn't be that? I mean, vice versa, I mean, or a, a, the president, or some organization, we go, wow, that must be really rewarding work, and then somebody comes by, we ask him, well, hey, what do you do? It's like, well, I work for this over here, and we go, oh, and then we sometimes feel deflated, don't we? Because we think that there's these two levels of, of job and career. There's ones that you can be satisfied with and there's ones that you can't. Well, I'm here today and I want to teach you the fact that no matter what you do, we can actually be satisfied in the work that we do, regardless if it's got a big title and a big plaque or a great package with it, or whether it's just menial labor in this world, we can have satisfaction in the work that we have done. And so we're going to be looking at this issue this morning because many people still are in pursuit of a better calling, that perfect job. But what's interesting is research has shown that no matter what career path that people are on, there's equal amounts of dissatisfaction across the board. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, or whether you're a janitor, there's equal amount of people that feel satisfied and feel like they are making a difference in the world in all those categories. There's also people that don't feel satisfied at all. So we're going to learn that it really is not about this perfect job, but we still pursue it, don't we? We ask ourselves questions like, what else do I need to do to get a better job? What other things do I need to learn so I can get a better job? What other connections do I need to make? What kind of social media do I make sure that I make sure I have a perfect representation? You're like, how many people are on LinkedIn? Anybody? Business people? Anybody? LinkedIn? Right? It's like, that's what they tell you nowadays. In college, it's like, you've got to build your profile. You've got to make sure you're linked in with many resources and many groups and many people because it's your, and you want those people to, to rate you and say, hey, you're really good at this, 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 and this. And you're kind of like requesting people to say, yeah, I'm awesome at this, 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 and this. So that when a job pops up, and what's ironic about LinkedIn is they give you a new job destination every single day. You know what, if you're on there, it pops up and says, hey, Rusty. Even though I'm in ministry and I put all this, I was like, hey, you would be a perfect candidate for these jobs. And it lists like 12 jobs. And you're tempted, aren't you? Some days, anybody, or is it just me? Let's be honest. Some days you go to work and you go, I don't want to do this anymore. Because it's not a perfect job. Because we're in pursuit of this perfect job. You know the one where you were well paid, you had an amazing boss, but if we're really honest, really the perfect job is where we are the boss. Amen? Amen. It's like, we don't answer to anybody. I am the boss. Well paid, have a cohesive leadership team, friendly culture where all your colleagues think that you are just awesome, that you are perfect, that they think that the world is hung on every word that you said and they can't wait to do exactly what you ask them to do. You have lots of resources. You have a short commute to work. You have reasonable working hours and they really don't ask you to travel a bunch and you can stay home with your family. So you create this wonderful life of work and, and life and it's just everything's rosy and wonderful. And oh yeah, they've got this wonderful benefit package where you get this free food and you always get gourmet coffee. You know, that job. 
We kind of think that there's this perfect, unique, singular job. And oh, well, by the way, to top it, like the, the cherry on top of the, the cake or on the whatever you like it, it may be, it's like, it's just like, I'm fulfilling my one true calling. Does anybody ever think that? You're struggling with that today. Many of you are going, I'm still looking for that one singular important task where I can say I have arrived and I'm fulfilled and I know I'm doing what God has called me to do. But does such a job exist? I don't think it does. And we'll get to why I believe that based on scripture and based on research. Millennials, how many millennials do I have? If you're a college student, if you're a, actually probably a high school student, you're a millennial. Raise your hand. Millennials, go ahead. Raise your hand. Here's some good news for research. Okay? You know, like when we were growing up, we thought we were going to get one job. We were going to have a, a golden parachute. You know, we were going to retire from the same place and we were going to get this gold watch when we retired. That's what my dad told me. He's like, hey, yeah, Rusty, you know, if you keep your nose to the grindstone, you put 25 years in, look what I got. I got a watch. <laughs> woo Dad. That just makes me go, woo. Yeah, I want to be a right-of-way man. Now, my dad loves that. He loves going to people's homes and basically paying them a little bit of money for their land so they can come through pipelines and all that kind of stuff, whatever. But, does that, but millennials, here's the deal. Research shows, on average, you will have 29 jobs over the course of your life. Good news, right? Isn't that good news? 29 jobs. Oh, and here's some good news for us that are still working our jobs. Research from Oxford shows that 47% of jobs that exist today will be replaced by technology in less than two decades. You feeling good about yourself now? You feeling good? Has anybody ever been downsized? It stinks, doesn't it? And if there is that one perfect job and we think that we've arrived in that one perfect job and then we get downsized, what happens? We feel like that we are unworthy, we're unvaluable, we have nothing to give to the world and we feel like if I can't find that exact same job, somehow I'm not worthy or I'm not important or I'm not of value. The truth is, maybe, just maybe, we're looking at vocation and calling when it comes to our particular career all wrong. Maybe we need to start looking at it from the possibility that just maybe, and I believe this is the truth, that God has created each of us uniquely with a set of gifts, a set of talents, and a set of abilities that he wants you to use to represent his name regardless of the position that you hold while you're here on earth. That you actually find your meaning by doing something that you love to do and that you're good at doing regardless if it has a title or regardless if you'll ever be recognized ever in this side of this life. But yet you know that you have an assurance and a satisfaction because you are good at this. That you feel joy most of the time while you go to work and you feel satisfied because your calling is not based upon the job that you fulfill. It's based on living out daily the life that you have been given by God with the resources that you've been equipped by God and created for so that you might represent his name. So I'm here to say, I really don't believe that there is one job for each person. One perfect job. The fact is, God has created you to be great and good and wonderfully fulfilled at whatever job you have. Because it's not about the job that you go to, it's about the person that you take with you to the job that's important. And if we are called into God, if we are called into salvation, and we are called to proclaim his excellencies in all that we do, no matter what work we do, that we're to glorify God, it doesn't matter the job I have. I should go and feel content that I get to use the gifts that I've been given on that particular day to glorify God's name, regardless of what it is. So if that job disappears, I still can feel contentment because I know that my calling has not changed. My importance hasn't changed because I can go to another job and still use the gifts that I've been given, the abilities I've been given to glorify his name, regardless of what title it may hold. It's a great example of like in my whole life in ministry, it changes in life. You need to understand that your job may change over the decades. And we need to be prepared for that, especially younger people, 29 jobs in your lifetime? Why? Because technology is going to change so rapidly that we're going to have to constantly develop and adapt the skills that we have been given to the culture that's around us. 
But God will allow us to do that. He gives us gifts and abilities to do that. But somewhere along the way, we have stopped choosing a career or a job around what we love to do and feel passionate about and are gifted for. And instead, we choose a job because of pressure from the world to say we've got to reach a certain status, maintain a certain checking account balance, or have a certain house or a certain car. And then we get trapped in this cycle. Then we get stuck in a job. Some of you adults know what I'm talking about. Then you get stuck in a job that you hate because you've attained a certain status level and your family expects a certain status level and yourself expects a certain status level because you feel like you're unworthy if you actually drop down a major level because you would feel happier and content because you're no longer using your gifts and abilities for the glory of God. You're using it to earn a paycheck and that is never fulfilling. It's fulfilling for a while, trust me. It's good to make money. Amen? Can we say that? It's good. Money's not completely evil. It can be used for God's glory and purpose, but if that's the only thing we're pursuing, it will leave us wanting and lonely. And there's nothing wrong. Don't get me wrong with pursuing things that we love to do. And if it, if it has great benefits, then praise God even more. But if it doesn't, that's not what makes us honorable before God. It's not our status according to the world. It's our status before God as children of God with gifts and graces that we use to honor him. So just maybe if we engage in a work that is out of our gifting that we love to do and that honors God, then maybe we will wake up every day and feel content with what we're doing for the glory of God. And then we'll stop looking at the horizon going, ooh, new job. Right? Is anybody guilty? It's like, maybe if I just get this one other thing, it'll be, I'll be satisfied. I thought that early on in life. I thought, man, it's got to be something else. It's got to be something else. Constantly moving and moving and moving and moving and moving and moving and finding out that really my discontentment was not about the job I was performing. It was the fact that I never was satisfied with the gifts that I had been given. And not grateful for the gifts that I've been given. Have you ever noticed as children that their personalities seem to be hardwired into them? <laughs> Anybody? I mean, how many of you have multiple kids? Anybody have multiple kids here this morning? Are all of them identical? <sighs> Were they all raised in the same home for the most part? Yeah. When I think about my two other brothers and myself and being raised with the same parents, the same philosophy, the same amount of economic, social dynamics around it, all of us are radically different. There is, all three of us are unique, unique, unique to say the least. No, not, neither, none of us do anything the same. You know, I'm the fake doctor. My brother is, my younger brother is the real doctor. You know, if I say to the Holiday Inn Express, I could operate on you, but it's not going to really help you. You know, my older brother, he's a manufacturer. Uh, basically, he works in manufacturing where he basically runs warehouses for like heating and air conditioning companies. Radically different. Radically different, all of us. But we were all raised by the same people, have the same DNA. But we have this unique design that's been set in our DNA by a creative father. Psalm 139, 14 says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I want you just to think about that for a second. Do you believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made today? The truth is the world knocks you down so much and tells you what you're not good at that most of you don't believe that you're good at anything. And the truth is you're still trying to run and chase after gifts and equippings that were never your design in the first place because the world tells you that it's better. Or you'll never be satisfied if you don't look like this or you don't talk like this or you don't have this career or this car or this expectation. But I want to hear to tell you today that part of our gift mix, part of our career search needs to be understood that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. God doesn't make junk. He doesn't make a mistake. You are unique and created the way you are for a purpose, for an intent, for a reason. You are the way you are because no one else can be like you are. And there are people in this world and there are careers that are in this world that only you will be satisfied in and only you will find hope in and only you will find joy in because of how you were created by a masterfully designing father who loves you and thinks that you rock. 
that you are perfect just the way you are. You are how many of you ever prayed that prayer? Have you told God that? Lord, I praise you today. Now you've been thinking, well, that's kind of egotistical. No. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Guess what, folks? We're part of his works. And my soul knows it well. Do you know that this morning? Because the first part of choosing a career and being content in a career is to know, to know that you know that you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you exactly with your quirks and your uniqueness and your special gifts. And you don't have to be like anybody else to feel important and to feel valuable because God made you exactly the way you are for a purpose and a reason. And it's time to start evaluating ourselves because we were created in God's image so that we can bear his name in his image from this day forward. It's important as we look for this career, you may think we're chasing rabbits, but we have to know that we are complete in ourselves. Because if you don't know that, you'll never be satisfied no matter what job you pick. Because you'll always look to fill a void that you can't put a thumb on or a finger on and explain it. Because you're trying to be something else rather than simply being who God created you to be. Now this next passage I'm going to bring up, probably you think, well, that's usually for a kid's message, right? Proverbs 22, 6 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now a lot of times we, we misrepresent this passage. First of all, it's a proverb, it's not a promise, right? It's not a guarantee. And a lot of times we use it with the fact, well, as long as I teach my kids the Bible and take them to church, that they will never leave Christ. That's not what this passage is talking about. What this passage is talking about, actually in the Hebrew, and the way he should go, literally the Hebrew can be translated into a meaning of that we are created with a certain bent, a certain design, a certain mark, a certain DNA thread that is unique to us. And as parents, and even as adults, we need to recognize that unique DNA thread and actually raise up our kids and actually raise up ourselves in that until the day that we die, that we don't depart from it. That we accept the fact that we have been hardwired by God for a reason and we're okay with that and we delight in that. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about because when you have your first child, you want them to be exactly like you. Don't they, for the most part? Blaine, I apologize because when he was born, man, I don't know about you, but I love football. I loved it. Maybe I'm just not all there mentally, but I loved the hitting I loved inflicting the pain. Maybe you're thinking, oh man, that really explains some things. God has removed some of that from me after religion came into my life, after God restored me, but I loved it. I mean, I loved the aggression, the, the fear that you could put in someone's eyes when you, you came down the line and you said, you know, it's over for your kind if you come this way. You know, I just loved it. I mean, I loved it. I wanted my son, Blaine, to experience that pain to inflict on another individual. Sports, I man, I wanted him to be a star football player. I didn't want him to make the same mistakes that I made and take it for granted, the gifts that you have been given. And like I said, okay. So I put him in, in Texas. You know, if you don't play football, you're, well, I can't really say what you are because it's from the church. But in Texas, if you don't play football, you're strange. And so I, w I put my kid at like eight years old, full pads. And so in the ninth grade year, he played his first year. He loved it because he was playing with kids his own age. Nine years old, you know, he was playing and a coach goes, hey man, he's got some talent. He's got some skill. We want him to play on our select team. Would you let him play? It's going to be with nine and 11 year, through 11 year olds. And I'm going, yeah. They recognize the talent, my boy. Yeah. He's going to be a chip off the old block. Yeah. Well, he was a chip off the old block because he got knocked out. Because he was playing, he was 70 pounds soaking weight at nine years old. He was playing against 11-year-olds that were 200 pounds. They weren't fat. Stocked. Their running backs were average of 127 pounds. And every time Blaine on the corner, he'd come around and try to tackle this poor kid. It was 120 pounds and 70 pounds. The law of physics don't work out very well for you. Right? He was in the proper place all the time, but his head hurt all the time. He says, Dad, I don't want to do it. And finally, I had to have my wife tell me, it's like, Rusty, you can't make him into something you want him to be. He's not you, he's him. 
So I had to realize this, like, I got to stop looking at my son as a, as a chip off the old block and say, no, he is a chip off of God, the father's block, and he is designed perfectly and unique. And he's not going to be like me. He's going to be like him. And he's fearfully and wonderfully made, just like my daughter is fearfully and wonderfully made. They are both radically as far off the reservation from each other as you possibly can get. <laughs> if you know my kids, it's like Blaine is very quiet, reserved, intellectual. My daughter is like me, woohoo, party, right? He's kind of like, yeah, rock and roll, kind of thing. Like, they came from the same gene pool. We did, I mean, but God created them fearfully and wonderfully made it. But yet our job as individuals from this point on is to say, look, you are gifted and unique and important in the way you are. You don't have to be like any other teenager. You don't have to like be like any other adult. You can admire someone, but you are created to be you and no one else. No matter what job you have, you will fulfill your destiny and you will be content if you just accept the fact that you are good in how God has created you. And so our job as adults is to tell our kids that you are not to be anybody else but you. And you need to learn to be content in whatever it is that you do because you bear the name of Christ and you represent the name of Christ. And whatever you do, you can feel proud and feel like that you are rewarded for what you do. It doesn't matter about your paycheck and the total that you bring. I will be proud of you, my son, no matter what you do, or my daughter, no matter what you do. And adults, we need to hear that again, that God is proud of you no matter what you do as long as you bear his name. But unfortunately, many times we lose sight of this when we grow up, don't we? We lose sight of our gifting, the things that we love, and we stop pursuing jobs that are based on things that we enjoy. And we start pursuing things based on the paycheck or what it, the status it will bring us. And hey, folks, that's not a way to live a life. It's not the calling that God has given us. It's not the prestige or the approval that gives us hope or joy. It's not the security that we should seek. We should embrace our true calling, our true mix, our true design, because God has uniquely gifted all of us for a purpose. There's not one single job. There's multiple jobs that you can fit in because Ephesians chapter two tells us that we are his workmanship. I think God knew that he needed to remind us that we are important. We're his workmanship. We aren't shoddy. God built us unique. And he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, no matter what we do, there are good works that he has for us, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're to walk in them. We have to know ourselves, folks. This is what I'm getting at. The long way to lead up to this is the first thing we need to know in choosing a career is you first got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. You have to know how God designed you and not be ashamed of how God has designed you. Because most of us apologize over and over and say, God, why am I not this? Anybody? Why can't I be like that person? Why can't I have their gifts? Why can't I do what they're doing? Well, the reason is, is because you're not them. But that's why we have to go back to this thing and say, we are fearfully and wonderfully made and God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make accidents. And whatever gifts you have are enough. What would happen, church, if each and every one of us would simply be content in the gifts that we've been given by a loving father and be satisfied with the work that he has called us to do because he's prepared work for all of us. There's a job for all of us, no matter how great or how small, we can celebrate in that fact because we are his workmanship. We can truly find satisfaction we all have gifts to be used no matter what the job. As long as we're using these gifts to honor him and represent his name, then we can truly learn contentment in work no matter whatever that work is. But we have to know ourselves in the way that God created us so that when the calling that we seek and the job that we pursue, we understand it's not the job that we have, it's the person that we bring to the job. Calling isn't our job, it's what we bring to the job. And what do you bring to the job? You. Your calling is unto salvation to bear the name of Christ, to use your gifts and abilities for his glory. No matter what you do, work it for the glory of God and be content, be satisfied. Be joyful in the fact that you are bringing honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the great I am. So myth number one that we need to break about our calling and work is there is not just one specific occupation 
for each and every one of us or one particular place for each and every one of us. Now, there's some people that find that and they stay in one job. I'm not saying that, but for the most of us, there's not just one place that we're going to be at for our rest of our lives and one particular work that we're going to do for the rest of our lives. There are a wide variety of jobs that could become your vocation that you will be satisfied in because your calling is in a specific job. It's your unique gifts and life purpose that you carry out for the honor of God because you have been created unto him. So finding your vocation, finding the common thread in the things that you love to do, the things that you're passionate about, the things that you feel uniquely suited for is the first step to finding hope in what you do. And whatever job you have right now, what would happen if you go in on Monday morning and instead of looking at the job as a, as a means to provide for your family, what if you looked at it as a means to use your gifts for the glory of God? How would that change the whole situation? How would that change the whole outcome? And then actually look for ways that you are gifted to actually improve the place that you're at by using the gifts that you have. Rather than simply punching the clock and only doing what they've said that you're called to do, look at ways, talk to your boss or whatever it is like, look, you know, I love to do this. I feel passionate about this. I think I could make a real difference for the company because this is what I was created to do. It's what I'm good at. What would happen is we began to rechange the whole way we look at work and life. So step one is finding our personal calling. It's to get to know yourself. And that will take a lot of work because most of us don't know very much about ourselves. Because we're afraid to really ask the really important questions. Who really am I? What did God really create me for? What are the gifts that I really have because a lot of times we are pursuing gifts that we think are cool rather than the gifts that we actually have. We're pursuing work because it will satisfy this world expectation rather than satisfying the depths of our soul. And it won't be easy to evaluate ourselves because we've got to be honest with ourselves. And we have to be true As Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You see, all of us have unique gifts and equippings, and it's assigned by the measure of God's grace. It's God that gives us the gifts. It's not, and sometimes we think it's unfair, don't we? Anybody? Anybody? It's like, why did that person get those gifts? I wanted those. God is saying, you don't like the gifts I gave you? I'm all-knowing, all-powerful. And I know that these gifts that you have are actually going to be more satisfying than the gifts that I gave to someone else because it fits your unique personality and your design. We have to be honest with ourselves and our giftings and our abilities and what we love to do. And we need to ask those questions. We need to ask others. You know how it is when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, man, what do you think about that? Was was that that really good? You know, out of really kindness, what do we usually say? Man, that was great. You know, sometimes we need to sit down and have the hard truth and go, that stunk. Can we be honest? And you think, well, Rusty, that's rude. What's more rude? to encourage someone to live in a gift that they stink at or to actually tell them that they stink at it and then actually find and help them find and discover a gift that they excel at and that they will actually rock this world with. What's more harsh? We need to make sure that we are honest with one another and and help each other in a loving and gracious way and the key is loving and gracious. It doesn't mean walk up and be like, man, that stinks. Because people can be cruel and we are jealous and sometimes our observations are not always adequate. And we also have to be aware that sometimes when someone starts off using their gift, they're not very good at it. (laughs) And they need to work at it and they need to be encouraged in it so they can develop that. But we've got to be honest with ourselves and know that our true vocation is learning to keep in mind the things that we're good at, that we're gifted at, that we're equipped at. But another thing that we have to understand in this is That work is not effortless. I think one of the big lies (laughs) that we think about calling is that if I actually have to struggle at it, it's not my calling. Does anybody ever think about that? If I have a bad day, it's really not what I'm supposed to do. Has anybody ever thought that? How many of you come home and told your spouses or your friends or your parents, like, I'm done, that's it. 
Finished. Just me. Now, I have those days. To be really honest, I have those days. Sometimes I'm like, God, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. He's going, quit whining, Rusty. It's not always easy. And why is it not always easy? Because Genesis chapter 317 tells us this. God tells us, so I'm putting a curse on the ground because of what you did. He's talking about Adam and Eve's sin. And all the days of your life, you will have to what? Say it with me. Say it with me. Say it like you mean it. This is another myth of finding our calling. We think it's going to be gumdrops and lollipops and roses and, and wonderful things. If we, it, it, well, it can't be my calling because I just, it's hard. Yeah. You know why? Because of sin. God made our work hard because of sin. Work is not the bad thing. Because remember, work was created before the fall, before sin entered the world. Actually, work used to be completely enjoyable and it was easy. But because of sin, it became difficult. So if you are trying to gauge your career and your calling based on the fact that it's difficult, I'm here to tell you something. You are chasing the wrong rabbit. Because every job, no matter if you love it and it gives you joy, it's going to be difficult some days. Some days you're going to want to quit. Some days you're going to want to give up. But what keeps you going back, what keeps you going on, is to know that this is what God designed me for. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of work. But thank God that he's given me the abilities and the tools to manage the difficulties for his glory and for his honor. And so that the joy is when we get through that difficult thing, that day I wanted to quit, if I persevere and I get on the other side and I see the reward that God has for me because I stuck it out. And that God had a purpose for me right where I was, no matter how difficult it was, but too many times we quit and we fall short because we, as soon as we hit something hard and we hit a roadblock, we say, oh, that's it, I'm done, God must not be calling me here anymore. God has gifted you, equipped you, and designed you, and put you where you are for a reason. It may be for a season. It may be for a lifetime. But we've got to learn to trust that God doesn't make junk. He doesn't make mistakes. And where you are is for a reason today. Now, God may change that job in three weeks, four weeks, a month, seven years, whatever it may be. But regardless, we need to change our philosophy and change our attitude. There isn't the perfect job. There isn't the perfect career. There isn't just the one perfect calling. The calling that we have is unto salvation and to proclaim the excellencies of God and the joy that we have in Christ, no matter where we are, no matter where we're called, and to use the gifts to bring joy and honor to the king so that we show those who we work for that what we do is we excel and we seek for excellence because that is what God's design and imprint on our life was for. Whether it's an accountant, whether it's a stay-at-home mom, whether it's a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, a janitor, all those are worthy callings. You've got to also understand that it doesn't mean the title makes it a worthy calling. Your calling is important, whether you're a trash man or a doctor. In God's sight, you were equal, of equal importance to make equal destiny upon this world and to make an equal impact for the kingdom of God. So if you're struggling with your job this morning, if you're struggling with your career, your future, I'm here to tell you some good news. You're not junk. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. It's time to begin to take stock in the gifts that you have and delight in them. And say, this is what I'm good at. And I'm gonna start pursuing and using those gifts for the glory of God. So that when this life is over, I can know and be satisfied that it wasn't about the job or the career I had. It was about the person I took to the job and it always represented the name of Christ. And that's hard to do. We don't always do that. But we have got to trust God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. <laughs> in all your ways acknowledge him. and He will make your paths straight. When it comes to our calling, our job, it's not about the job that we possess. It's about the gifts that we have used for his glory. No matter what the title holds, 
You are of value today, and I want you to hear that. You don't have to become a pastor. You don't have to become a doctor or a lawyer. If that's what God is call, calling you to, if that's what he's equipped you for, then go after it with your whole heart because it will bring you joy and delight. But don't just seek it because that's the cool thing to do. God has equipped you. He has made you the way he has made you for a reason. And when we intentionally depend upon God for his direction, we will experience his presence and tap into his unlimited resources. And then we will wake up every morning, even though we know it's difficult, we will find peace and contentment in the work that we have because we know the work that we have was given to us by God to bear his name and to glorify his name. What's your calling? It's to bear the gifts and the graces and the talents and the abilities that you've been given by a perfect creator in all that you do. That's your job. That's your future. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we know that we've got to know ourselves better. We've got to really seek your face and to know it's not what the world tells us that we need to be, it's what you tell us we need to be. And we need to learn to live and to walk on a daily basis in the gifts that you've given us. And that we will actually delight in the fact that we have been given these gifts and that we will not be discouraged and we will not compare ourselves anymore to other people's gifts because the gifts that we have been given were given to us specifically by God himself for a reason, for a purpose. So this morning, I pray for each and every person in this room, and I pray that you would begin to reveal to them how they can go to their school, to their workplace, to their home, and to implement the gifts that they have been given and actually find satisfaction, to find peace, to find joy in the work that you have called them to, the work that you have prepared for them, to know that this job may, that they have may be for a week, it may be for a lifetime, but regardless of the length of the stay, it's about the person that we bring to the job, it's not the job. That we bring the gifts and the abilities we have, and if, as long as we use those that God has given us, we have not wasted the gifts and the graces that we have received. Help us to bear the name of Christ today. And to not be ashamed of how we were created. Because God doesn't make junk. He doesn't make mistakes. So the reason you're the way you are is for a purpose. Tap into the, the good and the great potential of those gifts and use it for his glory and use it for his grace. Speak to us, Lord. Give us contentment in the work that we have been called so that we might bear your name and give glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Let us stand as we close this morning.